Welcome to Passion Church. For more information about Passion Church, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. in this series called Altered. We've been talking about altars. We've been talking about the fact that many of us as we were growing up had different kinds of encounters around the altars. We, many of us spent some time and uh, some, man, I, can, man I, I just, I start having flashbacks like I've been on a trip or something. I don't know. I, I, I see old wooden altars where it's shellacked like 97 times and so that when you lay your forehead up and raise up, it just rips the skin off. Y'all don't know. Uh, padded altars, kneeling benches. Some of you even had altars in your weddings. Y'all remember that little kneeling bench y'all got down on when, it, like you're presenting your marriage to God and, and, and like there's a nine minute song that's sung during that time so then it gets really awkward because you're like man what, how long the altars well we've established this fact altars are not our idea in fact, altars are birthed in the heart of God. We, we, we've stated this already that uh, altars are mentioned 370 different times in Scripture where God w would talk about altars and the people would build altars and memorials to spend time with God because what we've recognized and what we understand is is that God meets men at altars. It's as we spend time in the presence of God at an altar that He interacts with us and that He talks to us and that we get to know Him. Are y'all here this morning? Y'all already gone to sleep on me. Come on now. Uh, y'all going to do a lot better if you interact with me, I promise. Uh, uh, altars are important in our lives because that's where God meets with us. And it seems like we get further away from that now and, and, and you don't see them as much in, in the body as, as you used to. But it doesn't really matter if they're pretty altars or ugly altars. They're needed because of what they allow us to do. They allow us to encounter God. And so I begin in week one uh, and challenged you out of Paul's writings in Romans chapter one or chapter 12 verses one and two where he says to us that we must present our bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, I said to you that he tells us we should live altered. What that means is, is that minute by minute, uh, and maybe you're like me, and it, uh, it, it probably needs to be second by second. Second by second, and minute by minute, day by day, week by week, month by month, we, we come into this daily habit of offering ourselves as a sacrifice, saying, God, I lay my life down to you. I give you my everything. I submit my life entirely to you. Because Paul made this fact known. He says, if you don't live an altered lifestyle, you will then become cultured. You will begin to think like your culture. You will begin to talk like your culture. You will behave like your culture. The only way to battle this, this insidious culture that we live in is to become altered so that daily we submit ourselves to God and we lay ourselves down and make sure that Christ is in fact king. The second week I took you into the second encounter at an altar. It was uh, the account of Noah. Although we've... Uh, Childrenized, if you will, the the account of Noah and made it the subject of our nurseries. The truth is, is that that was not a pleasant experience. The Bible talks about how Noah w literally watched and stood there and saw as it played out in front of him the entire extermination and annihilation of everything that lived, everything that breathed. And the Bible says that when the waters receded and he comes out of the ark, the first thing he does is he builds an altar teaching us that in, in every moment of our life, in every season of our life, we should remember to build an altar and give thanks to God. In fact, I told you what he really taught us was that right in the midst of the hardest moments of your life, the most painful seasons of your life, you should stop and build an altar of remembrance and remember that if it wasn't for God on your side, where would you be if you were if it wasn't for God bringing you through how would you have gotten through in the first place if it wasn't God that healed you you'd still be sick if it wasn't God that set you free you would still be bound Noah teaches us that we should build an altar and say God thank you 
Anybody thankful this morning? I, am I the only thankful person in the house? I, I, I can just remember where I would have been if it had not been for the Lord. And so I'm thankful. And I challenge you to become like David. The Bible says that David makes a covenant with himself. And in Psalm chapter 77, he, he establishes this covenant. He says, I will remember. I will ponder. I will reflect. And so I challenge you to make a covenant that while everything around you is falling apart, you come to this place in your own walk with Christ where you make a covenant with your God and with yourself and you say, I will remember. My bills are due, but I will remember. My kids are acting crazy, but I will ponder. My, my car's not out, acting just right, but I will. Re I got to build a covenant, establish a covenant of remembrance with Him. Mm. Then last week I took you into Genesis chapter 13 and 15 and talk to you about the three altar encounters that Abraham has and we discover that uh, on three different occasions Abraham builds an altar in a direct response to a promise and I said to you that if we could ever learn to get in the altars and just be quiet anybody been struggling with that this week uh, we out talk God See, God is a, a, a promise-making and a promise-keeping God. God has a pinky, and he will pinky swear with you. But in order to get the promises of God, you've got to learn to get in the altar and be quiet long enough so that you no longer confuse your voice for his voice. I'm preaching right now. So I, I, I've met way too many people that will get into an altar, and they talk so much that they get up, and they will try to convince you that God has approved things that are in direct opposition to his word. And what I submit to you is that they've not not listen long enough man they talk so much in the altar that now they think their voice is God's voice and you can't convince them otherwise but let me just give, give you a little litmus test his ways are higher than our ways and his ways are not my ways I if, if my way if I have to convince God that my way is his way I'm in trouble if I have to get into an altar and try to convince him that my thoughts and my opinions and my solutions are better than his solutions, I lose every time. You've got to get into an altar and get a promise from God directly from him. And then I told you that Abraham showed us in Genesis chapter 15 that, that I can tell when people get a promise from God because they'll fight you for it. Abraham had to fight for his promise. The vultures swirled around the altar of sacrifice that he had made as, a, as a, a response to promise. And I said to you, there are going to be moments in your life you've got to get a promise that's worth fighting for. You, you've got to understand that, that the enemy's going to swirl around you and try to bring in doubt and fear and, and questioning. And you've got to come to this place where you get enough of a promise from God that you're willing to stand up and say, hey, I don't care what you bring against me, enemy. I don't care what my family says, what my friend says, what the doctor says what the banker says I heard from God and I will fight for this promise y'all ain't helping me this morning oh. so we've talked about an altar of remembrance and we've talked to, about establishing an altar of promise but this morning see here's the truth I, I kind of like the altar of remembrance now I'm gonna be honest with you I forget to say thank you sometimes I, I know I'm the only one and I go through life and life is good and things are going great and I see God come through and I fail to establish an altar of remembrance and thank I, but I kind of like altars of remembrance when you when somebody challenges you to stop long enough and say thank you isn't it interesting that all of a sudden you can list about nine million things that you're thankful for thank you for thank you for my car thank you for my clothes thank you for my kid thank, yeah yeah I can just I can list them all so I kind of like that one I really like altars of promise I mean, when the God of the universe looks down and he begins to speak to you and says, I'm going to do this for you. There's going to be favor on your life. I'm bringing provision into your life. I'm going to use your family. I'm going to step. Man, that's good stuff right there. I kind of like that altar. But this morning, I want to take you to an altar that I suggest to you is the most avoided altar. This one ain't no fun. It's the altar of sacrifice. Some of you just checked out because you don't like this altar. Let me show, show you. Let me show you. You know where I'm going. Genesis chapter 22. I'm going to read to you out of, 
uh, Genesis chapter 22, beginning in verse 1, and I'm going to read down through verse 13. I'm going to read it slow, and I'm going to give you some nuggets. I, 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 I don't mean to preach every word of this little text here, but, man, there's some stuff in here you got to see. Genesis chapter 22 says this. After all this, God tested Abraham. Pause. I didn't get very far. After all this, you need to go back and find out what that refers to. You need to go back and remember it and go read what happens in Abraham's life and you recognize that what's taking place is 25 years have gone by of where God had given him a promise about having an offspring and he's waiting and he's waiting and he's waiting. Hurry up and wait, y'all. 25 years. You need to recognize that in, this, in, the, in the meantime, Abraham got nervous and got, got impatient with God and took matters into his own hands and slept with his concubine and gives birth to Ishmael. And that wasn't going so hot because Ishmael didn't like Isaac. After all this, God tested Abraham. May I mention to you this morning that after all you've been through, after all the pain that you've gone through and after all the sickness that you've endured and after all the heartache that you've witnessed and, and been a part of, even after all of that, God will still test you. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate you encouraging us today. Thank you so much. My life is falling apart. And now you're saying after all this, yeah, I'm just, I'm just warning you. After all this, that's why we avoid this altar, because we don't like the consequences of this altar. After all this, God tested Abraham. God said, Abraham, yes, answered him. Pause. No, I can't preach that. I just wish we'd get to where we say yes to God. I, I just wish instead of, wait, wait just a minute. That's what my kids do to me. Hang on. Beat the hang on out of them sometimes. Uh, hang on. But we do that to God. And Abraham came to this place in his walk with God when God said, Abraham! He went, yes. The answer is always yes. That was free. Yes, answered Abraham. I'm listening. He said, take your dear son Isaac. One version says, your only son. Whom you love and go to the land of Moriah. And sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I'll point out to you. Oh, pause. Abraham, on two occasions now, the first one took place when he was living in the land of his father. The Bible says that God called to him and said, Leave your father's land and go to a land that I will show you. And Abraham set off and began to follow God. Now Isaac is on the scene, and God speaks out to Abraham and says, Abraham, follow me to a place that I will show you, and you are going to sacrifice your one son that you love. And Abraham willingly followed God. I submit to you this morning that Abraham followed God, but we want God to follow us. How many of us walk into situations that God didn't ordain for us? How many of us walk ourselves into sinful situations and ask God to tag along? I know you don't want me to go here, but, but could, you, could you just follow me into this, God? I know I spent my way into this situation, but now can you follow in, in after me and clean it all up? I didn't ask you. I didn't pray. I know I got myself into this relationship, and I didn't stop one time and ask you if it was all right. They just look good in those jeans, and I followed them, and now I need you to Abraham followed God, but we want God to follow us. Word. That was free too. So Abraham got up early in the morning and he saddled his donkey. And he took two of his young servants and his son Isaac. He had split wood for the burnt offering. He set out for the place God had directed him. And on the third day, he looked up and saw the place in the distance. And Abraham told his two young servants, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I are going over there to worship Catch this. Then we will come back to you. Y'all got to know something going on right there because Abraham had been commanded to sacrifice his son. He wasn't going to scratch his son. He wasn't going to nick his son. He was going to take a knife and bury it in the chest of his son. But he makes this statement, we will come back to you. 
I want to tell you this morning that the reason that we are in the progression we are in at an altar of remembrance, an altar of promise, and then the altar of sacrifice is you will not respond correctly at the altar of sacrifice if you haven't spent any time at an altar of promise because Abraham was able to say, we will go over and worship and we will come back to you because he had been at a place of promise and he'd gotten a promise from God that he believed in so strongly that the writer in Hebrews says that Abraham's faith was so strong that he believed that he could actually take the knife and plunge it into the heart of his son and God would raise him from the dead if he needed to. You got to get a promise that will sustain you when you're called to an altar of sacrifice so that when God begins to cut things out of your life, you can still go to that altar and say, God promised me that I'm going to come back out of this and I'm going to be all right. The reason some of you don't visit the altar of sacrifice is because you ain't got no promise. We will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he gave it to Isaac his son to carry and he carried the flint and the knife and the two of them went off together and Isaac said to Abraham his father his, his father father yes my son we have flint and wood but where's the sheep for the burnt offering and Abraham said son God will see to it that there's a sheep for the burnt offering he's got a promise and they kept on walking together and they arrived at the place to which God had directed him and Abraham built an altar and he laid out the wood then he tied up Isaac oh by the way most people think that Isaac was 25 Abraham wasn't he was old so there's some cooperation going on here because I got news for you Isaac could have run and Abraham would have never caught him and yet he tied him up and laid him down obedience he laid out the wood then he tied up Isaac and he laid him on the wood and I, Abraham reached out and took his knife to kill his son just then an angel of God called out to him I'm glad Abraham knew how to listen Abraham Abraham well I don't have this written down but I gotta stop and say this you will never hear God call your name to rescue you if you don't learn to hear his name before you need rescuing. Wow, somebody write that down for me because I don't have that in my notes and I'm going to add it. You will never learn to listen to God to hear your name in the moment that you need to be rescued if you haven't already learned to listen to his name prior to needing rescue. God help us to listen. Yes, I'm listening. Don't lay a hand on the boy. Don't touch him. Now I know how fearlessly you fear God. You didn't hesitate to place your son, your dear son, on the altar for me. Abraham looked up and he saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. And Abraham took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. A couple interesting statements and then I'll get out of your way and we'll spend. This is why we flip the order of service. We normally do announcements and offering at the end, but we're going to spend some time in the altar this morning two interesting statements here God speaks to Abraham and says to Abraham take your son of promise Isaac whom now this is important stay with me whom you love y'all get that take your son of promise Isaac whom you love and sacrifice him I need you to understand this morning that is an excruciatingly painful demand how many parents we got in the room come on raise your hand you stop one moment put yourself in this story that is a painful request see here's what I need you to understand the altar of sacrifice exposes our idols. See, here, here, here's, the, here's the deal. We don't mind giving God what we hate. I can't get no help. I don't, have to, uh, I, I don't mind coming to an altar and say, God, I, I hate my weakness. I'll lay that at your feet. I don't mind coming to the altar and, and say, God, I hate my sickness. I'll lay that at your feet. God, I hate my addictions. I'll, give, I, I, I'll lay that at, I, I, I hate my deficiencies. I'll lay that at your feet, oh God. I will sacrifice all those things I hate. But what if God requires what you love? It, it, 
would have been one thing if God had said to, to Abraham, give me Ishmael. Well, I didn't like him anyway. Let's go. But that, that's not God. God requires what we love. Like, what if I love to spend all my time on the golf course? And God says, you're chasing that little ball around the course, but you're not spending any time in my word. I don't like that all the time. What if uh, I like to spend money without thinking, but God steps in and says, hey, wait a minute, I need you to give rather than... What if he says that relationship you're spending all your time in and pursuing, I want you to stop. See, we avoid the altar of sacrifice because it requires us to give up things that we love. It exposes our idols. And I just need to tell you this morning and be honest with you that at the end of life, our greatest regrets will be whatever we didn't give to God. This one's for free. You didn't pay for this one, so let me just throw this one in here. Can you imagine the lesson that Abraham just taught his son Isaac? Isaac suddenly comes to a realization at 25 years of age at least that my dad loves God more than me. I want to challenge you this morning. When's the last time you showed your kids that you love God more than anything else? I mean, they see you sacrifice for work, and they see you sacrifice for play, and they see you, see you sacrifice for success, and, and they see you sacrifice. But when is the last time you took a step in your walk with God where they recognize that you love God even more than you love them? Well, it's free. You didn't have to like it. It was free. You didn't pay for it anyway, so... The second statement that I see that's interesting in this account, listen to this. God says to Abraham, catch this, bring me your only son, Isaac. Wait a minute, God, you've got bad memory. I don't know if God's got some issues. I mean, he's getting on up in age now. Maybe he's having a little kind of, you know, you know, parents kind of get up there and they start forgetting stuff. Have you forgotten, God, that Isaac is not his only son? I mean, are you that forgetful, God? Okay, let me, okay, God, I'm going to have to help you out. You don't even remember what happened. You've just, you've been so busy, I guess, hanging stars, dealing with earthquakes. You just overlooked. Isaac's not the only one, God. Hello? Remember, there's another son, Ishmael. You know that son where I, uh, Abraham got nervous and got tired of waiting on you, so he took matters into his own hands and slept with his concubine because he was tired of waiting on you. So now he took matters into his own hands, and now there's an offspring by the name of Ishmael. And God says, Abraham, give me your only son. God will never accept and will never validate our answers as his answer. That was good. You don't have to shout me down. I just need to tell you that the reason I bring that to your attention is because I find it very interesting that we so often hear a call to sacrifice, and what we do is we substitute. Rather than obeying completely and specifically, what we do is we, we substitute something that we choose, something that we love less, something that we don't mind losing. Like God says, I need you to serve. And you go, hey, wait a minute, God, my time is so valuable. I can't serve, so I will substitute. What I will do is since I don't have the time to do what you're asking me to do, I'll dig a little deeper and give a little more money because I can always get more money, but I can't get more time. And God says, I ain't accepting your substitute I will not validate your answer. I will not validate your solution. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Therefore, you can give me all the money you want to give me. But until you give me your time. Just, just, just talking. Uh, isn't it interesting how uh, I, I, I'll quit spending time with so-and-so. Even though you told me to spend, quit spending time with them, I kind of like them. So I'm going to keep Facebooking and Twittering and calling and eating lunch with and spending all my time. I'll give you this other relationship because I don't love it as much. 
We substitute. Abraham didn't substitute. Abraham took the son that he loved. I don't, I don't know what the deal was with Ishmael. He didn't love him very much, but, 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 but he took the son he loved. And he gave God what he asked for. I just want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you. Give what God asked you for. Quit trying to negotiate your way out. I work a deal with you, God. If you ask me for 10, I'll give you eight and a half. Until I can afford 10. That's what we do. You told me to give my car away. I got an old one in the back. I ain't been able to drive. I hate that thing. I can't shift it in gear. I'll give that one, God. I'm just telling you what we do. That's why we avoid this altar. We avoid this altar because it exposes our idols. And the problem with that is that idols are dangerous because idols siphon our hope away from God. This altar of sacrifice forces us to assess our hope. I need you to understand. I, I mean, I get it. It would have been very easy for Abraham to have placed all of his hope in his son Isaac. I mean, he is the son of fulfillment. He is the son of promise. He is the missing link in the lineage. I mean, he is the one that is supposed to fulfill the promise that God has given me. I get it. I understand. Abraham had placed all of his hope in Isaac. And God forces him to reassess his hope. My question to you this morning is, where is your hope positioned? In the doctor? Is your hope in, placed in your IRA? Is your hope placed in your house? Is it placed in your friend? Is it placed in your family? Have you put all your hope in your material possessions? Here's the truth. An idol is anything that takes God's place in your life. So if your hope and your trust that should have been placed in God, we used to sing, uh, I'll get the lyrics wrong, but uh, my hope is placed in nothing less than Jesus Christ's righteousness. Something like that. We used to sing that hymn. Uh, we've gotten away now. We put our hope in, in everything else. We put our hope in, in our own abilities. We put our hope in our boss. We put our hope in our, in our house. We put our hope in our car. We put our hope in, um, I can get in those jeans. We put our hope in all these stupid things. And God says, I bring you to a place of sacrifice so that you have to come back and put your hope in the one place it should be. Idols siphon away hope. So my question to you is this, this morning. What's your no? What is the one thing in your life that if God asked for right now, you would automatically say no? He asked you for that relationship? No. He asked you for that possession? No. He asked you for that, whatever it is, no. Then may I suggest to you that you have just exposed your idol. Because you've placed your hope in that rather than him. I'm preaching right now, and I'm just trying to help you to tell you that some of you need to find out what your no is, and you need to lay your no on the altar and say, "This is, I will give you everything. See, I, I, I just want you to understand this morning that Abraham would laugh at our painless, cheap altar experiences. We want altars to be about a dance, and his altar was about death. We want our altars to be about a shout, and his altar was about a slaughter. We want our altars to be about pleasure, and you just need to understand that his altar was about pain. We want altars to be about getting, and Abraham's altar was entirely about giving. Oh, this particular altar. Come on, Steve, preach to us about bringing our needs to the altar, please. Yeah, we'll do that next week. Because this altar is about hard choices. Painful choices. Have you had an altar experience lately that has forced you to make any hard decisions or hard choices? Abraham took a knife in his hand and reared back to kill his son. That's a hard choice. I would submit to you this morning that there are some things that you need to lay on the altar and kill for God. Maybe it's 
your will, maybe it's your pride, maybe it's your desires, maybe it's your preferences, maybe it's your fear, maybe it's your anger, maybe it's your blank. You fill in the blank. What is it that you need to lay down on an altar and kill and say, God, I give you this. I don't want to give it up, but I will. See, I want to question whether or not you've visited an altar of sacrifice unless we can begin to see some things removed out of your life. Some of you hadn't had anything cut out of your life in a long time. Finally, let me just say this quickly, and then, I'll, and then I'll get out of your way. The altar of sacrifice tests us, and it reveals whether or not we can be trusted. I bring that to your attention because I have determined that for most of us, altars are about whether or not we can trust God. I'm, most of us only use altars to test God and see whether he can be trusted. We come to an altar and say, I'm going to lay my needs at this altar, God, and I'm testing you to see whether or not you're going to come through. I bring my sickness to the altar, God, and I'm testing you to see whether you're trustworthy or not. God, I, I'm going to bring my need, and I'm going to lay it at the altar, and I'm testing you to see whether you can be trusted or not. That's why we don't like the altar of sacrifice, because at the altar of sacrifice, the, 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 the script has been flipped. And it is at this altar that God tests us and determines whether or not we can be trusted. See, the reason many of us are never trusted is because we continue to fail the testing. We hear the command, and we compromise. We hear the command, and we delay. May I bring to your attention this morning that when God said to Abraham, go sacrifice your son, he instantly obeyed. In fact, the Bible says he got up the very next morning, gathered all the supplies, and set off on a journey. And yet, we like to procrastinate when God says, and I just want to inform you that when you procrastinate in obedience, you have walked right into disobedience. Just trying to help you. We don't like tests. See, I want God to bless me. I want God to pour favor on my life. I want God to give me promotion. I want God to fill my life with pro provision and opportunities. But I want you to understand that before God will do any of that, God will test you to see if he can trust you. See, we've stopped at this altar of remembrance and we've discovered that he is trustworthy. But it isn't until we come to this altar that God discovers whether we're trustworthy. I just want to tell you this morning and then I'll, and then I'll stop. It, it is uh, true faith is tested faith. Some of us claim faith, but we really don't have any faith because as soon as we're tested, we lose our faith. True faith is tested faith. In fact, Andrew Fuller may have had it the, the correct, and, and I'll read this twice to make sure you get it. He says that a man has only as much faith as he can command in a day of trial. Ugh, we want to be considered faithful and we haven't been tested we can't congratulate you on your faith if you've never been tested you ain't never faced nothing ain't never had a hard day ain't never had nobody walk out on you ain't never had nothing happen to you it's easy to have faith in baby but he says a man has only as much faith as he can command in the day of trial if you're going through something right now, we can congratulate you on your faith when you walk through that trial and you come out like gold. See, here's the truth, and then I'm done, I promise. Trust gets you into trials. That's the disclaimer. You know, you got to put disclaimers on stuff. I just need you to understand that if you're going to trust God, get ready. I'm going to trust you, Jesus. Get stinking ready. Because trust will always take you right smack dab up to your eyeballs and beyond into trials. Never fails. But here's the hope. Trust also gets you provision out of thickets. <laughs> yeah, you're going to face some trials if you're going to trust him. But the good news I've got for you this morning is that on the backside of that, if you come out trustworthy, 
There will be provision in places you didn't expect it, and there will be rams in thicket. I, I don't have time. I don't have time. Some of you just thinking, I just trial, 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 trial. Just hang on. Just prove yourself faithful. Just prove that you're trustworthy. And God will open up the windows of heaven. And right in the midst of the moment that the hand is coming down for the final blow, your eyes will come up and you'll look to the hills from whence comes your strength and your help. And God will rescue you. But you got to trust him first. So my question to you simply this morning is this. I'm glad you spent some time at an altar of remembrance and remembered everything God's done for you. I'm glad you got a word of promise from God. you got to have one before you get to this altar. But this altar is no fun. So my, altar, my question simply this morning is this. What do you need to sacrifice? What do you need to give up? What is God calling for you to lay down that would prove to him that you're trustworthy? Because at the moment you offer that, Father, this morning, I recognize that this is not a fun altar. This is not about a dance or a shout. It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Church resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion.